Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm joining you from a moving train today. So uh, I would like to welcome Jola Burnett. It's a, a real pleasure to have you and thank you for accommodating us. We're, we're jetting about the place at the moment. So Jola, tell us a bit about yourself and, 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 and how you came to be working in, in your field. Um, so thank you so much, Neil, and hi, everybody. My name is Yola Burnett, and I have no problem. It's okay. I never, it's okay. Yola is fine. And Yola is thank okay, you, Yola. too. I, I've, been, I've been called all sorts of names, so don't worry about it. Uh, so my name is Yola Burnett, and uh, I work at, I'm a vice president at GFK Consumer Life. Um, I've uh, studied consumer trends in the United States and globally, and have been doing it for quite a while now. Uh, it's fascinating to understand, you know, the trends and, and consumers. We really give the voice to the consumer, uh, listen to them passionately uh, and uh, kind of analyze what they tell us and couple that with everything that's going on in the marketplace and the world a lot of the innovations that are happening to see you know and understand trends and where we're headed and how that affects consumer lifestyles and their needs and i can't hear anybody Yes. Well, so, uh, yeah, he's going to he's going to jump on and off because of the train. So he, you know, Neil might not be able to join us. Um, so it was nice that he was there. But Antonio, I know you have a comment. So. Yes, I do. So Joel, when, uh, today, if I jump on uh, social media, you know, I have hundreds of posts about millennial consumers. You know, uh, uh, all marketeers seem to be focused on, on that group. Okay, we on, on this group on Access Chat, we have been uh, advocating a lot about aging uh, uh, people with this. Where do you where do you see uh, opportunities for marketeers in this particular space? When it comes to aging, yes. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to, uh, you know, serving the needs of the aging population. And as we know, the world is aging, right? There are, you know, certain markets where, you know, the they lead on aging populations. This is the future. We are aging. We're an aging world. Uh, and there are a lot of opportunities, especially when it comes to technology, to help um, help make their lives better, improve their lives. So if you think about perhaps even thinking about technology that helps them age in place, right? Uh, where, you know, they don't have to give up their car keys. Perhaps autonomous vehicles will help with that, you know, because they won't have to worry about having the driver's license. They can just get in the car and operate it with their voice. So again, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for technology to come in and help solve for the issue and kind of demystify some of the technology through the very easy user interface. Um, and, and there's, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of other opportunities when it comes to solving for loneliness uh, as well. I think this is a big issue and we all know that, you know, there are studies to prove it that um, having more of a social interaction helps that helps aging consumers be healthier and anybody to be honest. Uh, and, you know, having that capability to be able to connect with their family or their family to check in on them, um, you know, is, is again another opportunity area uh, to make sure that they're well connected and they don't feel lonely. Um, there are also trends when it comes to technology helping consumers monitor their health. Um, that's been a big trend and we have been seeing, you know, a lot of sensors um, that are being now uh, connected in a lot of different places to make sure that these consumers are okay. You know, that, um, you know, um, even, even Apple now is, you know, one of the um, um, you know, the innovation that they have now is monitoring your heart rate, but also thinking about, I think it's EKG or ECG that's now been approved by the FDA. Uh, I mean, one of the, one of the, you know, kind of smart ways for Apple is to go after these older consumers who may have been more resistant to this type of technology. But if you think about it, it's also doing a lot of good in terms of providing the opportunity to monitor their health and perhaps prevent um, you know, serious issue from happening or alerting, you know, you to make sure that you need to call an ambulance in the timely manner. And these are just some, there's plenty. I could be, I could be talking at length. 
No, no, thank you, because uh, I, I've been looking to some of the things that you have been publishing and uh, and some of the conversation that we have in on access chat over the last couple of years, and we see plenty of opportunities for marketeers to shift their to other groups uh, and sometimes leave it behind that obsession that they have uh, in relation to millennials. I'm sorry, I'm having a, uh, there was a little bit of a breakup. Could you repeat mm -hmm. the question? Because I'm not sure if I, um, I got the whole question. Yeah, you're breaking up a little bit, Antonio. And I know Neil's having problems on the train. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, I'm glad he's joining us as long as he can, <laughs> as people get on. <laughs> Hello. Go ahead, Antonio. Have no, what I say is, uh, I, I've been following some of the, the some of the posts that you that you are sharing, and it, related with with uh, with opportunity in in marketing. So, what opportunities do you see for marketeers in paying more attention to the to the audiences that you have just uh, uh, commented on? Um, definitely, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to. Um, you know, expand their market share by not alienating this group of consumers, because like I mentioned earlier, they are a growing segment of the population. And in a way, I think they're becoming a little bit more underserved in some of their needs. Um, so there are definitely opportunities to listen to them, to understand their um, attitudes and behaviors, but also really their needs. Uh, to make sure that, you know, the marketers are putting forth um, the right products and services for them. And, you know, the key message here will be to make sure that that consumer, that aging consumer is at the center of the product or service, uh, that this, they're not kind of an afterthought, that, that, that it's not the product and the center that's in, you know, that in, on the pedestal, but you really have to understand that consumer, get down to their level and provide something that really solves for their needs. So there's, there's just a lot of opportunities in this arena. Angela, I know you're very interested in the topic of allergies. And I don't know if that was something we wanted to talk about or if we want to stay on this topic because this is a really powerful topic too. But we want to make sure that because you actually are an expert in multiple things. So I wanted yep. to give you the chance. Do you want to move to that topic or stay on this one because both are so powerful? It's really up to you. Happy to talk about food allergies as well. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So yes. It's something that we haven't talked about very much, and I know it's a huge issue all over the world. Certainly, I have many, um, many friends that have children with allergies. Of course, the one that is often the scariest is the peanut, the severe peanut allergies. And I was on a plane the other day, and the, they came on and they said, we have someone with a severe peanut allergy, and so we will not be serving peanuts today. And they, they didn't serve it on the plane, which I thought was very accommodating of them. But it, it's a huge issue. And I was talking to a mom the other day about her daughter who has very severe allergies, and her um, her first child actually died um, mysteriously, so what we would call Sid's death. And then she had the second, she had this um, beautiful daughter aunt with severe allergies. And so now there's, they're thinking that maybe the first baby had severe allergies too, but they did not realize it. But it's a huge topic when we're talking about disabilities and true inclusion. And, uh, and we find that a lot a lot of people, just from where I am, um, they don't know how to deal with this in our school systems and our workforce and things like that. So uh, I think it is a topic would be that would be very interesting to our audience. So um, absolutely, it is a topic that also very near and dear to my heart uh, because I also have a child with severe food allergies. Uh, when he was first born, 
um, he was reacting to everything and we didn't know what was going on. Um, everything that, um, you know, I decided uh, kind of the mom gut feeling, we tested him for him to be positive. Uh, he ended up, you know, at nine months old with about 16 food allergies altogether. I've never seen or heard anything like this. We don't have any history of food allergies. So it's been a complete shock to us. Um, I accidentally nearly killed him at nine months old. We had six ambulances in our house. So since then on, we have all been on pins and needles. And, you know, I think what is important to understand is to educate. I think that's what we have been doing. Um, because there is a lot of innovation out there for many different, you know, disabilities. And some of the obvious are obvious. If you see somebody that can't walk or can't talk and not to discredit those at all. Uh, but at the same time, there is a lot of hidden disabilities. You can't, when, you, when you're talking to my son, you can't, you can't really see or tell that there's something holding him back. Uh, but, you know, in the United States, I don't know how it is in other countries, but here at least um, food allergies are classified as, as a disability because they interfere with a life function. And the life function here is eating, right? Uh, and it's been a really scary ride. Um, you know, I, it's, 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 uh, it's really scary to think that you look at food in the same manner. Um, you know, you look at a milk of glass and it's, it's, a, it's a glass of arsenic or something that can kill your child, even a small amount of it. Uh, for us, you know, it wasn't really peanuts. Peanuts are really well advertised. I think uh, the awareness of nut allergies are, is very prevalent. But if you really look closely at the numbers, dairy, milk is one of the biggest allergens. And it's hidden. It's in so many different places. Uh, it was airborne for my son. He had a reaction from walking into Starbucks, like steamed milk actually caused a big issue for him. Uh, whereas, you know, so I think what, what we have been grappling with is that awareness to make sure, you know, it's, it's just, there's a lot of misunderstanding around food allergies. You know, some people think that maybe, you know, we say, okay, please don't send this to the classroom. Like maybe they can have it in the cafeteria, but not in the classroom because of the crumbs and, you know, uh, can cause a big reaction to him. Um, but I think it's more about um, making sure that food allergies are demystified, right? And we have seen a lot of snafus. I'm not sure, can you, I can't hear you, uh, Deb. I am here. No, I'm here. I, w I was just letting you talk. <laughs> I'm trying we to be can quiet hear you. for a yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, we can hear you very well. Sorry about it's an important that. topic. Yes, yes. I think food allergies need to be demystified. And, you know, I have personally, it's, it's a hurtful topic for many parents, especially those grappling with food allergies, because we have seen that they're often a butt of jokes. We have seen a lot of different, you know, even in, in kid movies, um, which a lot of the studios have apologized for some of the scenes, which can be hurtful because each year, there are fatalities, you know, people who die. There are children who, who die because of this. And it is not funny. It is really not funny. Your, your throat closing is a terrifying thing. You're grappling for air, grasping for air is not a funny thing. That swelling no. is not a funny thing. It is really not. And I think there is a huge opportunity for marketers and brands to embrace it and educate it. I want to start. Uh, I want to start a campaign. I think the ALS campaign with the you know ice bucket challenge was amazing. You know, I would advise. Um, some of the people to try, some of the audience to maybe try, try to remove dairy, eggs, and nuts from your diet for a week and read the label and make sure if there is an ingredient you don't understand, research it because it might be a hidden ingredient, right? Maybe you won't right. go as far as overloading companies to call to make sure it was made on the same line. But it is hard. It is really hard and is really misunderstood. Uh, the other thing that a lot of marketers may not be realizing is that if you have a family with one food allergic child and that child cannot eat at your restaurant or fly your airline, the family of four will not go to the restaurant. The family of four will not fly your airline. 
there is a missed opportunity uh, to make sure that accommodations can be made. It is really not that hard. Um, and I'm not sure if compassion is something we can teach consumers. I think there needs to be a little bit more legislation and education as well. Right. Yes, I know that. I know that my um, my son, um, I gave him uh, dairy um, until he was about, and he, he always had stomach problems. And around eleven, it was a buildup of the constant dairy because he he wouldn't he didn't want to eat meat, and so he, I was pretty much giving him what he would eat cheese pizza, and it was actually killing him. It was poisoning him. So oh, wow. he now is a vegan. <clears throat> but his was not quite as serious. But I think a lot of people think allergies, they're, they're just like, they think of it as maybe something like my son choosing to be a vegan. Now, my son is a vegan for all kind of reasons, but he also has a, a dairy allergy, as do I and as do my daughter. But ours is not as severe as some of my friends where, I, I mean, they, there was this terrible story in the United States of a a middle school um, boy kissed his girlfriend after just having peanut butter at lunch and mm. he accidentally killed her because yep. she had such a severe peanut allergy. Now, how horrible for everybody. And But we're seeing this more and more and I find the families, they once we once you've lived with it and become an adult, I think a lot of people are used to knowing what to do. But how horrible that you can't walk into a Starbucks because they have steamed milk in, in the air, which would make sense. I never think about it. But it is a really big problem that seems to be growing. And I know we put all the ingredients on the labels because I'm always reading the labels when I buy something for my son. But often there's something that I didn't know had those inside of it. And then as you said, I'll see this was made in a manufacturing plant that also does eggs and blah, blah, blah. But it is such a huge issue. And I know it's all over the world, but, and it seems to be growing or maybe I'm just hearing more about it. So I don't know if this is, this problem is getting worse. It appears to be getting worse, but I'm not sure. Yes, absolutely. So it does appear to be worse. And, you know, just to, to quote some stats here from, you know, some of the government data here, you know, honestly, there are about 32 million Americans um, in the United States. I mean, 32 million Americans who are affected by food allergies, out of which about 6 million are children. And if you think about, you know, the 32 million Americans, so essentially, if people with food allergies were a country, they would be about the size of Malaysia, which is huge. Um, you know, the other thing that we're seeing is that um, the CDC reports about 50% increase in food allergy in children. This is a little bit of an old statistics, not sure why there isn't an update on that, but you know, between 97 and 2011, there has been a 50% increase in food allergy in children. Uh, food allergies send, you know, somebody to the emergency room every three minutes. Um, and and it's, 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 it's staggering that, that this is happening, where we're seeing, um, you know, these younger generations to be more affected, at least in, in our research, we're also seeing that, um, you know, millennials are, are a lot more affected than, than, the, than some of the other generations. So this is a growing problem. This is something that is on the rise, that needs attention. Um, and there was a lot of opportunities to accommodate, to make a more inclusive environment. Um, you know, one of the, the, the stories that we had is my, you know, uh, it was a few years back when my son was about maybe three or three, four years old. We were supposed to go to this um, private language school on Saturday. And uh, we, we, I spoke to everybody, the, the principal and the teachers about his needs. And I said, I can be there. It's a weekend. I can sit, you know, outside or, you know, in the corridor, anywhere you want me to. I will be there if in case. And he will be, his food will be sent out. Um, and they said, yes, that's fine. On the first day of school, there was a huge miscommunication. Nobody wrote to me or called me. We were asked to leave we were asked to leave the school because they said they're not comfortable with my son being in the classroom. Uh, it was really heartbreaking because it was at a point where he was able to understand and process it. We we both walked out of there crying and just went for a walk at the, at the local beach. 
and it's just it just goes back i think it's beyond education i think it was just more of a challenge for them because i said but how about i i can even be in the classroom in the back i promise i will not make a beep i will just sit there if you need me next to him i can be how about outside in the corridor no okay then i will sit in the car in front of the school no it was a no it was a no. It was so they didn't issue. accommodate you because no. that's a, it's an accommodation issue. And I know Neil has a question for you, yeah. but if that is an accommodation issue or an adaption issue, you know, with, with speaking from the UK lens. But Neil, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So um, we know that anaphylactic shock is very, very dangerous. We are now um, but there is a lack of EpiPens available. So there's a global shortage of, of the, the things that could save people's lives in these dire circumstances. Uh, certainly in the UK, we're, we're seeing a lack of pens. My wife needs them. Um, I'm sure your son needs them. How are people coping with, with that, uh, that shortage out there? Um, in the United States, I believe it's not necessarily as much of a shortage of EpiPens as it is access to them. There has been, you know, a lot of talk about the prices of EpiPens, you know, about, you know, some of them were uh, over $600 that the parents had to pay out of pocket, which was unbelievable. But we know that there are a lot of uh, options that, that are less expensive, you know, and I think there could be an opportunity to make sure that there are newcomers to the market that um, kind of challenge that notion that an EpiPen has to be a $600 thing, a $600 medication, when overall you could do a $10 injection. There is a $10 injection, but it's just not every parent is going to be able to do it. Um, also, just lately, there was a legislation passed that, um, you know, we're, we have seen that um, public schools need to carry an EpiPen that can be used for anybody because there were circumstances where there was an EpiPen for one specific child and then there was another child that was dying in a, in a baseball field from a snack that they didn't know they were allergic to and that nurse couldn't use that EpiPen because it wasn't prescribed for that child. So now there is an EpiPen that the nurse can use and it's kind of communal uh, so whoever has a need it can be used on. Um, but there is globally, I think there's a lot more work to be done. Like you're saying, you know, shortage in other markets, that's unbelievable. But we have neighbors, we have, not neighbors, but there was somebody, a friend of a friend who said, um, you know, they have a child with food allergies, but they can't afford an EpiPen. And this child goes to school and is on the line and goes mm -hmm. to practice and is, you know, like in the school he might, he or she might be protected, but going to private events, not having that EpiPen, an EpiPen is, is truly um, mind boggling and, and it's kind of scary. And, and it's, um, Neil, how, do you know why there's a shortage of EpiPens in the UK? I, I just haven't heard of it. So I, I was, I mean, the pricing uh, part I've uh, heard so, of. So, so, so it's all yeah. cost. Uh, so God. It so, is. Yeah. Uh, even lives. Though, uh, it, Yes, yeah, so even though it's subsidized by our National Health Service, the fact is that the supply chain which has been living because one single company owns the rights to manufacture these things. Okay, all right. That is a, that is a, that is a big issue. Um, that is a big issue for sure. And cost. Yeah. So, yeah. right. So you're going to say, um, Antonio, send your daughter to school and you can do it without what he needs to, you know, to save her life. That's chilling. That's very chilling. And um, it's, it's, I think, a topic that we often are not speaking about when we're talking about disability inclusion. And it's a huge topic. And it seems to be growing and growing and becoming. I, I was talking to one of my, the friend that I was mentioning, and she said, well, the school won't accommodate my daughter for blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, but wait a minute. She's protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And she said, no, no, she's not. And I was like, no, I believe she is. And and she went and checked and we I was correct, luckily. And so she went to the school and said, you know, then she threw the ADA down on them and they were like, oh, okay. Because they understand they have to comply with the ADA, but it's su such a shame that I have to throw legislation at you for you 
to, you know, keep my child alive or, you know, an adult alive. It, it's, it's hard to live in the world when you have these allergies. It's because the world is definitely not aware or um, it, so it, it's to me, it's so indicative of what we deal with, with disability inclusion. And, and Antonio brought up the aging market earlier. And I don't know that as we age, we um, these issues become larger, but it makes sense that they would because our bodies change and shift. But it's it is something that people really need to stop trivializing. Uh, I, you know, my son's issue was very, very bad gastric you know, response, but it wasn't going to kill him. Um, but I don't know if we kept feeding him food that's poisonous to him, maybe it does. So Antonio, I wanted to make sure I gave you a chance to, uh, uh, you know, make a comment or question. No, what uh, is you know, t today people tend to use the web to do a lot of search and sometimes they do, they don't really search in the right way. So Jola, from your experience, you know, what are, you know, if someone is looking for information that can help them, that can cope with the needs of their children in, uh, uh, with allergies, what are the best places for people to go or where, where should they go uh, to, to avoid to be misled by information that can populate just by doing a search on Google? Yeah, a search on Google can be just dangerous, um, but there are a lot of great organizations that are doing great work in this arena. Uh, you know, one of them is FAIR, Food Allergy Research and Education. Uh, and if you go on their website, you will see a lot of resources, a lot of education, action plan that teachers, doctors, and parents of you know, food allergic children should have. Some of them don't even know what a, you know, what a protocol or, or an action plan is. It should be personalized to each and every child. Um, another great organization is uh, kfa.org or kids with, fit, uh, with food allergies.org. And actually uh, that organization has helped me personally a lot. There were a lot of free webinars that they do uh, to educate parents like myself uh, and like you're saying, this woman who didn't realize that she was protected by the ADA, uh, to kind of make sure that there are things you can put in place, there are steps you need to take to make sure that your child is protected. And in the end, you know, one of the key takeaway is, take, takeaways is it's, it's an uphill battle. We know that it's an uphill battle. We have to continue educating. But I kind of, to answer your question, these two resources are the best. But um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's early in the morning. Well, and because, those are U.S. Because, uh, resources. The, the, are there yeah. global? Yes. Yep. Go, sorry, Antonio. No, well, because this, no, the idea is this. This could be a, a very scary situation for young parents. Yes, it, it absolutely is a very scary situation for young parents. I've also found a lot of closed social media loops or Facebook groups to be very helpful because it's a place that it's a closed group. All everybody in that group, um, you know, has someone or knows someone or is a, as a parent of a, of a child with food allergies. And what you can do is really talk openly, compare experiences, uh, educate each other, you know, and if somebody misspeaks about something there's you know others that are doing a good job policing or correcting uh, making sure that you don't use these use these groups with a grain of salt because these are not medical professionals you can use them to perhaps kind of try to find um, you know somebody to talk to about it educate yourself a little bit but make sure that you go back and still follow the advice of your medical professional that is going to be very very key you know um, so, um, there are a lot of resources, you just have to search for them. I think FAIR uh, is, you know, out of the United States, uh, so is KFA, but I would presume that if you search for the website, you can access it from anywhere in the world. So, you know, the, the, the only problem is that there might be a, a language barrier, perhaps. So that's another issue, you need to make sure that, you know, um, folks in, in markets that are not in English speaking have access to these resources, um, you know, because as you can see, oh, I, we, there's a lot of research which shows that food allergies are on the rise, not only in developed markets, but in developing economies as well. This is a global problem. So from, uh, from your experience and, and from the 
from the, the fact that we had the opportunity over the years to reach out many people in this space. Do you see that the uh, medical community uh, are aware of, of this or sometimes not all doctors are, are ready to take care or to answer the questions from the family? Uh, it varies. We've had different experiences and have heard many different stories. Uh, there was also, I don't want to call out, uh, you know, there was also a, a very misleading article that, you know, a journalist did and interviewed, quote unquote, an allergist. And there was a lot of misleading information. Um, and one of my allergy friend, you know, one of the parents had to write to the publisher to make sure that they retract it because it's hurtful. Uh, so there was a lot of great doctors. Uh, there was a lot of, um, you know, a lot more awareness than there was in the past, but there was a lot more work to be done. Uh, you know, not everybody is on the same page. Not every doctor is on the same page. And we've, we've changed, we've changed our doctors as well to make sure that you find someone that is right for you, that understands your needs. If you're not comfortable, keep searching. It's okay. It's okay. And in the end, you know, um, there was a lot of resources, but again, have to find the right ones. It, it seems like end, you're person, searching. Yeah, sorry. Because in the, in the end, that person is going to follow to your journey, is going to be kind of a, a trusted partner uh, uh, during the, the, the time that your child is growing and changing. Absolutely. It has to absolutely be a trusted partner that understands your need. Uh, and it's not a top down, I'm the doctor, listen to me. It's a dialogue because food allergies are very enigmatic. Not everybody reacts in the same way. Not everybody reacts to the same ingredient on different days. You know, it, it can vary. It really can vary. It, it's, you know, it's how the body works. Um, sometimes, you know, although some are guaranteed, some are super guaranteed. I don't want to misspeak because some you can absolutely guarantee there's going to be anaphylaxis uh, the minute the child or the person comes in contact with a certain ingredients. But there is a degree of food allergies. You know, some people might have gastric issues. Other people, you know, might have an itchy throat. They classify that as food allergies. Food allergy doesn't equal a food allergy. There is a there is a different a plethora of levels um, when it comes to food allergies. My son was allergic to 16 things, and you know, eight of them could kill him on the spot. The other eight, where you know, he would get somewhat sick, but maybe they wouldn't be as life-threatening so, so there is definitely there has to be that understanding that you know especially when you have a server at a restaurant and somebody says that's also very hurtful uh to make sure that one part of education is for others who are not allergic to something don't use food allergies as an excuse that they don't you know when they don't like something don't say that you're allergic just say no i don't like it it's okay and it's okay um you know another one is the about this chef on the yola yola can, can i ask everybody to mute because we're getting interference so that um just so that we can hear you better i apologize go ahead no problem <laughs> right. i think we're good um you know, another one, I read the story about this uh, chef who uh, bent over backwards, you know, made this gluten-free pasta for this customer, you know, really took precaution to make sure that that person is safe eating, you know, at their restaurant. And then at the end of the meal, they ask for beer and beer contains gluten. So that alone kind of is damaging you know if you just say you know i don't i try to avoid gluten for just because it's healthier not to there's a fad right avoiding gluten because maybe it helps you lose weight just say it um but you know don't use food allergies as an excuse that that's hurtful to to the allergy community and putting other kids or people at risk because if that chef wasn't as aware he would have thought no allergies don't really exist i can i can still give them regular Food and that could potentially be life-threatening to someone. 
And I think that's a good point in that that's something that we need to teach because my daughter used to say, um, my daughter with Down syndrome used to say she had an allergy to butterscotch. And I, I was like, butterscotch? So, but I think you're right. I think that people uh, sometimes minimize it. And even my son, you know, allergies, it's such a wide range and they shift and change. And then we have extreme um, seasonal allergies, which are problematic for my daughter. When she gets these allergies, if we're not really careful, they go into pneumonia. So, but still that's a secondary response. It's not like, you know, you're going to die because, you know, so it, it, there's so much misinformation. And I've also seen people preying upon the nervousness of the parents. It, I, it, this happened to me when my, we learned our daughter had Down syndrome. We started getting all this, well, if, if you give her some, you know, urine from this animal, blah, blah. And, and so there's a lot of scam artists out there preying upon our fear and our, our, you know, wanting our children to be better. And it really becomes, you know, consumer beware, buyer beware, those kind of things too. So there's, there's a lot of multi-dimensional problems associated with this. And, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it's really scary, but I, I know that we're um, out of time and we appreciate the work that you're doing both from the marketing efforts that you're making, because I know Antonio and I and Neil, we're all, we, we all love the content that you put out on micro I mean, out on the social media um, topics, but I know that aller this allergies, this is a real passion project for you and something you want to help all of maybe the access chat community can get around you and really help turn up the volume on these things, how serious they are and people not being trite with, Oh yeah, I've got an allergy to that. When really I'm thinking, well, like you said, I'm not going to eat you know, this today, and maybe I'll lose a couple pounds. So we accidentally, we accidentally water down these really, really serious issues. So um, I have so many friends struggling with it. It's, it's a, it's a huge issue. And I know it's something that you really want to, you know, you really want people to understand Yola. So we very appreciate all the work you're doing. And, um, but I, I want to make sure that we give you, uh, that, uh, you know, time to, you um, you know, just sum up and then we'll come back and we'll close. But we definitely appreciate all of the work you're doing, uh, including the work that you're doing with the allergies. And so right back, give, yeah, and give right it back, back to you. Right back at you. You are doing amazing work as well. And thank you so much for, um, for letting me um, talk about it. Uh, you know, essentially, uh, in closing, I wanted to say that there's a lot of education to be made and it's all about a partnership and dialogue. It is not a fight. It is not somebody trying to prove a point. It is more about the way I go uh, about it or in talking to teachers and doctors and restaurant owners is how can we work together? Can you help me feed my child? How can we work this out? Let's talk about how it's made and, you know, no attitude. There should not be an attitude from either of the side. We're just trying to do something positive, um, you know, and something simple as feeding a child can be such a challenge. Uh, I think there's still a lot more work to be done, a lot more awareness when it comes to, um, you know, the overall community, uh, to make sure that this is, I'm hoping that I live to see a day where food allergies are no longer a joke, um, you know, because I think that is that is super scary. Uh, you know, you go to take your child to a movie and you never know if there's going to be a scene that's going to cause anxiety. Uh, there's a lot of children who, who are anxious. Um, and then going back to the topic on aging, um, again, same thing. I think we need to, you know, and we've seen a lot of, from the marketing standpoint, even when it comes to beauty, we have seen some movement in the positive direction where, you know, we want to disband the idea of disband the idea of anti-aging. It's a stage of life, just like everybody. And woman doesn't lose her value because she ages. Everybody ages, you know, uh, we're all heading in the same direction and it's okay. It is okay. Um, it's a privilege to age. And, uh, you know, like you said, having your hair purple, I absolutely love that. Enjoy the moment and I think there could be great opportunities to let um, you know older folks enjoy their moments and make their lives better and easier um, you know it shouldn't be a stigma to be old absolutely or to be food allergic it's it's yeah 
or any other any other thing. I mean, it, it's what makes us human. And, and I, what you know, when I decided to let my hair go gray or silver, I I kept I turned sixty in December, and immediately out of the gate there was this really good article about aging, but it said. Um, 60 is the new 50. And I yeah. said, no, it's not. 60 is the new 60 and we need to own 60 and yay, how fun is this? There, there's, It's really pretty cool to get to a certain age because a lot of things I used to worry about, I don't worry about anymore. And so, and I don't think there's anything wrong with dyeing your hair, but I thought I want to really own being 60 because there are 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 year olds that are wondering oh my gosh just 60 the kiss of death is 70 is 80 no it can be a beautiful time in your life and so we do need to go back and value every single stage of our life so um, it, we really do appreciate the work that you're doing with marketing and helping us understand all the different segments and how people are thinking and coming together and then I know that this is that allergies is a very very important topic to you and so many others so we appreciate your leadership in this so um, so thank you for being on the show today we really really appreciate it and we want to thank Barclays Access my clear text and microlink who is our newest sponsor for you know supporting our community and supporting the all of the efforts that we're trying to do here to bring awareness to these topics and really humanize the disability inclusion conversation so Yola thank you so much for joining us today we really appreciate it thank so we'll so talk to everybody yeah next week on um, on access chat so thank you so much thank you so much Deborah and to everybody out there understand everybody has something whether it's a visible disability or hidden disability own it don't let it stop you be unstoppable and hopefully yes. you market it and brands can help you do that as well thank you so much yeah well said thank you Yola we really appreciate thank you thank yes. you thank you really appreciate it them. thank you thank yes you. thank you Neil thanks Antonio bye everyone bye-bye thanks